Uh, hello. So, um, it's a bit awe-inspiring to be in a room full of so many PhDs, and I'm actually just a BA myself, but uh, <laughs> my qualifications is that I play hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of war games. So, <laughs> um, well, today I hope to introduce um, to the room uh, some of the difficulties of integrating archaeology-based uh, design um, into historically-based video games. Uh, and to begin, I'd like to acknowledge basically how sexism and paternalism uh, affects archaeology-based game design. So, uh, firstly, the effects of misogyny can have an impact on the absorption of archaeological evidence, either denying the evidence or downplaying its significance in design. Um, it can also affect how we design and integrate female characters and units in line with interpretations of the real world that rely on prejudice or moral and ethical frameworks that are patriarchal or paternalistic. Um, now, uh, really, when designing a video game, care should be taken to consider how design choices can reflect or enable prejudices of an audience. Now, whilst there has been progress in the last decade in one form of representation of isolated today, uh, there is considerable debate on the historical authenticity of such acknowledgements. Now, uh, before I really get going, it's probably important to mention that I plan in this presentation to deal with a very small part of sexism and its impact. Um, I choose to talk about this particular issue not to well, downplay the effects of sexism on others or to say sexism is only bad because it affects my wargaming, but because I thought it would make a good topic within the bounds of this conference. Um, so the effect of the uh, first example that I gave is evident in actually popular academic writing. You don't have to look very far. Uh, in fact, it is also in historical gaming opinion and video game writing, and you can see the trifecta start to affect each other. So uh, one example of popular academic writing and attitudes to women <coughs> warriors would be Steven Pinker's one-page dismissal in The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, released in 2011, page 634, if you're interested, uh, described as a brilliant, mind-altering book by The Guardian, um, Pinker, sexism ultimately arrives from the genetic incentive to control the behavior, especially the sexual behavior of women. The archetype of the Amazons and other women warriors owes more to men being turned on by the image of strapping young women in battle gear, like Lara Croft and Xena, than to historical reality. Well, it's odd that Pinker appeals to the idea that sexism is an innate human trait in his appeal to genetic incentive, and that 20th century examples of sexualized female combatants must show that the ancients had the same attitudes and motives for depicting Amazons. I would argue that this is basically a form of anachronistic projection. Um, whilst Greeks certainly did not shy away from erotic storytelling and mythology, the culture that inspired the Amazons simply lived the reality of mixed sex warfare. Now, the inspiration for the Amazons came from the Sarmato, Scythian, Saka, Steppe Nomad cultures of the Black Sea. Um, I can't tell you how hard it is to find a good distribution map. <laughs> um, now, despite the Pinker assertion being from 2011, a pair of studies from 2003 by Eileen Murphy and 2008 by Brian Hanks examining thousands of barrow tombs produced by the steppe cultures, often referred to as kurgans, uh, colloquially, regardless of their source, um, extrapolated that as much as 37% of kurgans warrior burials could be female. Now, if this is true, then there is more evidence for the existence of Amazons in kurgan cultures than for the War of Troy or the practice of crucifixion, which are considerably <laughs> less disputed and having a popular place in the understanding of history. Now, you can see these same assumptions applied to the idea of integrating women into war games at all. Now, uh, commenters feel secure enough in these assumptions to make sweeping statements on the abilities of women that can be disproved with even cursory research. Um, now, it seems that prejudice is such that if women are included, the attitude of some is that video games, after all, they're not meant to represent historical reality. And uh, in other words, that their presence ruins immersion and must be the product of applying 21st century feminism retroactively to historical conflicts. But as Pinker above aptly demonstrates, 21st century sexism can also be applied retroactively. Now, defenses of the inclusion of women often point to the unbelievable elements of war games, such as too many tanks for World War I, 
heroics and bullet sponging does not fit with combat realities and tactics. So the defense becomes an argument over the artistic merits of anachronism <laughs> instead of an urge to investigate if the inclusion of women is based on a historical reality. Now, to argue about the inclusion of women in World War I games as having the same merits as the artistic license then allows the inclusion of shotguns and submachine guns, despite their scarcity on certain fronts, ignores the issue that regardless of feeling, these women did actually serve and fight. To say otherwise is to erase the service records of veterans based on their sex. Now, for example, Maria Boshkareva led a combat unit of the Russian army in World War I, and if someone wants to move the goalposts by pointing to the British army, please remember that Dorothy Lawrence, also pictured, whatever the disputed elements surrounding the nature of her frontline work, is acknowledged by all as having served as a soldier in the trenches. Now, using Pinker's own choice of word for women warriors as Amazons, I have looked at two games in the historical real-time strategy series, Total War by Creative Assembly, and I will compare the treatment of the topic of the cultures that produced the Amazons. Which led me to uh, the case study part one, Rome, Total War, 2004. Now, Amazons do feature, for starters, the Greek myth mythical versions of Amazons are included, but as an Easter egg. Uh, Themyscira is included as a location in the game, but is designed to be largely inaccessible, as the cultures closest to them are either not playable, or have an economic incentive to travel south and attack continental Europe instead of exploring further north. Now, there are also uh, two units included in the Scythian faction, the Noblewoman unit, and uh, please note how seriously the descriptive text file for the unit takes a historical claims about step nomad cultures. Um, Adrian Mayer's book has a really wonderful deconstruction of the right breast mutilation story. Now, behind me is the descriptive text for the headhunting maiden unit. Now, it is a good example of the belittling and sexist language being used to describe a female unit for having exactly the same qualities as other light cavalry units in the game. Uh, another problematic element in the above is how it treats one interpretation of the Roman culture's attitude to colonization as a winning side of history. Now, uh, the text above makes clear that a woman's primary contribution to her nation's success is through reproduction, not fighting. Now, the presence, preservation of reproductive power and other paternalistic social mandates, even in the steppe cultures that produced and practiced greater gender parity, makes it harder to acknowledge that other cultures at the time actually did have different attitudes to reproductive rights. Now, this is despite the fact that whoever wrote the games had the good sense not to mention the Augustan family laws. Uh, which are the ancient ancestor to the early 20th century nationalist projects around limiting women's reproductive choices. And uh, as such, the idea of colonizing the fertility of women is more implied than stated. But the idea is that people will continue to reproduce as long as there is bountiful food. In this, we can see that the Roman way is treated as essentially like our strategists who use reproduction, weight of numbers, to overrun other cultural spaces. As such, women or men choosing not to reproduce is treasonous. However, by inverting the logic, if we see the Scythian way as case strategists reproducing in smaller, less resource-intensive numbers, then, arguably, there is less necessity to reproduce en masse, as nomadism is a defense in itself. By not being tied to any particular territory, the Scythians were, according to Herodotus, able to simply ignore attempts to conquer the Black Sea region by the Persians, in contrast to the extreme violence of the agrarian societies matched in the Greco-Persian wars. Now, despite the sex of soldiers and civilians having no impact on population growth mechanics in the game, a writer still found it necessary to include all the material above. This is pandering uh, to misogynistic and at least highly inaccurate views of Roman cultural attitudes for reproduction. Uh, now, the erasure of, the erasure of uh, women warrior contributions is supported in the <coughs> gameplay. If a player issues Roman heavy infantry-based armies and uses a nomad faction's light cavalry, it is possible to build an entirely culturally, strategically non-Roman army. In Rome Total War's expansion Barbarian Invasion, a player can have a viable all-female Sarmatian faction army, and the automatically generated captain unit is always a man. Which means that if your army performs well enough to get the Man of the Hour reward, where a captain is elevated to the royal family, it can never be a woman. <laughs> Now, I wrote a uh, subroutine, a, a mod, that added the armored female Scythian skin to the Sarmatian captain files in it took less than an afternoon. 
So ultimately, there was no reason not to include this function in the original design. Now, however, the modding community for Rome Total War's uh, most popular contribution is the question of Amazons reflect actually many of the prejudices outlined above. Uh, the design of women is either sexualized or heavily styled on mythology, and it's not evidence-based. Now, anachronistic elements in game design, particularly for time periods where the archaeological record is scantier than we would like, is often used for the sake of creating distinct cultural markers, like you know, memorable visuals for the different factions. Uh, one example is the hoplon, uh, you know, famous Greek hoplite shield that is included in both games, decades apart, uh, despite the fact that in reality, it had been phased out in favor of the Thurios by the time of the Roman invasion of Greece. And uh, one example I really like, <clears throat> extrapolating designs based on rare archaeological examples. Now, a complete bronze helmet with ram's horns is part of the design of the Armenian Axeman unit in Total War Rome II, despite its clearly ceremonial use and the incredibly expensive nature of its production. So, for the case study part two, we have Total War Rome II and Daughters of Mars. The highest rated uh, Steam comments tend to criticize historical accuracy of female fighters, and one of the top five acknowledges that women fought, but there were no dedicated all-female units then. A bold assertion. Well, a study in 1910 among traditional living Cossacks determined that sexual segregation could lead to all-female armed groups living as nomads. Now, to quote Adrian Mayer, whilst modern ethnography does not prove the antiquity of specific lifestyles, it does suggest the persistence of practical egalitarian attitudes over time. And for an ancient source, Strabo documented the ritualized coming together of single gender groups from two ethnically distinct groups in the Caucasus. Now, in Total War Rome II, the Scythian faction was given a free upgrade in a patch released alongside Daughters of Mars. And this time the Amazon unit's descriptive text file, oh, sorry. was basically able to distinguish between myth, ancient historiography, and archaeological record, and does not include the previous examples of demeaning or belittling language. Whilst the text and design has been improved in line with verifiable archaeological fact, there is still a glaring omission. Female leaders among nomads was still impossible. Now, the Masagite of Western Afghanistan are included in the game. But the Masagite are most famous for their part in passages of Herodotus' histories, specifically Book 1, Chapter 214. And there, Herodotus describes how Queen Tamaris ruled the Masagite, and these are related to the Somato, Seth, and Scythian Saka group, same as the other groups, and changed the course of history of the Middle East when she defeated and killed the progenitor of the Persian dynasty overthrown by Alexander. Now, she fought a successful demarcation war despite her army being at two-thirds of her nation's fighting power after the first wave of successful Persian assaults. And whilst this is impressive from a warfighting perspective, her presence and combat prowess is not treated in the text as being in any way extraordinary for her part of the world. Now, her victory is not attributed to a trick, luck, or strategic thinking. Herodotus' main criticism of the Persian account of the battle is that it is a very direct contest of strength on an open field and hence extremely bloody. It is not womanly wiles that carry the day or any other mitigations of her victory. She was just tougher. Now, simply put, she was historically incredibly important, but not uncommon as a product of her culture. In Total War, Rome II, the Masagite still had no access to female leaders. Now, so far over the 10 years between Rome Total War and Total War Rome II, some progress is made in increasing the historical accuracy of the game, but by missing the element of female leadership and succession, I would also say there is a great lack of progress. To put it another way, some progress, but not enough. Uh, in 2017, there was a DLC added that had some acknowledgement of female leadership. One campaign pack, Empire Divided, included Queen Zenobia of Palmyra, modern-day Syria and Jordan, as a faction leader. However, another omission was that although Emperor Aurelian of Rome, pictured there on the left, was succeeded by his wife as the mother of the empire during the interregnum that followed his assassination, she is not included. Which brings us to the fact that there is no shortage of Greek and Adriatic cultures with female war leaders. Uh, Artemisia would be a classic era um, classical era example of a Greek female leader, Carian Greek, uh, Carians were Greeks from the coast of Asia Minor, and she assisted Xerxes in the Persian Wars and became one of his most trusted advisors. Um, the Adriatic has female leadership in Hellenistic and Ro early Roman era, um, Olympias worked as a political enforcer for the future of the Molossian Argiad dynasty, 
whose most famous member was Alexander the Great. Uh, Alexander's half-sister Siam, uh, also known as Sinan, was a military enforcer of Molossian Argiad rule in Epirus and the surrounding territory of Illyria, and personally killed another Illyrian warrior queen in battle, Caria, and protected the dynasty's territory in the region while Alexander was away. Now, well into the Roman era, tutor of the RDIA of the Dalmatian coast, here pictured by Marius Kozik for the official artwork for the Pirates and Raiders DLC. Um, it also exists. <laughs> Another Roman era. I mean, I don't know what else you can say. <laughs> that. They recovered a horde less than 10 years ago. Um, now, Another Roman era example would be Mithridates' queen general Hypsicrataea, whose existence was proved in 2010 when a plaque was found uh, for the tomb dedicated to her. She was supposed to have helped organize and execute the guerrilla war that extended the conquest of Pontus by several years after her husband's army was defeated by Pompey Magnus, and she herself evaded capture for the rest of her life. Now, however, Creative Assembly must have known what was happening because they effectively retroactively worked on this problematic element of the game. And in 2018, a patch, not a DLC, not a paid for change in any sort of way, but just a update released via the uh, Steam client, um, allowed for female generals and leaders, although still mostly for non-Roman and non-Greek factions. So, arguments around the historicity of this well, they grew to the point where an official Creative Assembly spokesperson had to shut down the associated threads on Steam and uh, had to report several Steam users for breach of the posting rules, largely around abuse. So despite the historical evidence and the progress within the game design, it seems that not everyone in the gaming community has moved along with it. Now, I just wanted to leave the final question, which is, is part of the reason why people are so upset with this new contextualization is that if you play the Romans, it places you in the position of erasing cultures that had more egalitarian treatment of women. And perhaps if you're playing as the Greeks as well. Can you ignore the fact that part of the appeal of these factions that represent, in some eyes, the ancestry of the Western world is to role play as their most vitriolic, misogynist, and xenophobic representatives? This includes the way many of the pre-Westerners would have compared themselves favorably to the sexual equality favoring barbarians. <laughs>